Okay, there it is. So this is kind of like an anatomy overview. When you're looking at filtration, where's filtration happening at? I thought I heard it. The, it starts with the G. The glomerulus. Yeah, so it happens at the glomerulus, this little thing that looks like this. What are these blood vessels? Arteries? They're capillaries because they're filtering, right? So the only place you get filtration or exchange is at a capillary bed. So here you have the afferent arterial that you already know now is bigger than the efferent coming in. You filter out the things that you don't want, but unfortunately some of the things you do want accidentally get filters through, gets filtered through. It's one of the important things about filtration is it's non-selective. The only selective characteristic about filtration is size. That's it. So if you have something that's really teeny tiny, a single atom like sodium or potassium or chloride, little tiny atoms, they slide right through. Do you need things like sodium, potassium, and chloride in your blood? Yes. yes. So if you lose them, it can be problems. Filtration gets rid of things that are important to you. It lets glucose filter through. Do you want to keep glucose? Yeah, and it lets glucose slide right through. So this filtration product process is really only selective based on size. Kind of like the first week of class when we filter things based on size. Like the salt and the sugar and the quartz. So the three layers you have to pass through. If you take one piece of this glomerulus, like right here, and you slice across it, and you look at the actual blood vessel itself, you get a little closer, here's where the blood's at. What's the L word for this area? The lumen. So here's the lumen. The blood's flowing through from the afferent arterial coming in. It's flowing through here. About 80% will just pass on through unfiltered. But roughly 20% of that blood will seep through these different layers, and there are three of them. The first layer, actually, these little capillary pores are what they call fil fenestrations. So fenestrations or capillary pores is the first layer. That's the endothelial lining. What's endothelial or endothelium? It's the lining of a blood vessel in general. It's epithelial tissue, but it's the lining of a blood vessel. So it's like taking your fingers like this, holding them together. They're one finger thick, but when you hold them next to each other, you can see the little pores right here that things can leak through. That's what you're leaking through first. So we'll zoom in on that and look at that pore. Here's the pore. When something slides between the cells, the next thing it has to slide through is actually a, a it's almost like a cottony layer, like a filter, like a paper or a cotton filter that it has to go through. So this first hole, if it slides through there, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to make it through this next filter. This is kind of like that game Plinko and the price is right. So these things go bing, 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 and they start bouncing around here, and they come out the other side. So this basement membrane is this cottony, it's actually glycoprotein, sugar protein layer. So literally, it is kind of like cotton candy. And it gets filtered based on flat size again. Once it gets through the other side, there are special cells called podocytes, which mean foot cells. Oops. And these podocytes are these cells out here that kind of hold everything together. They wrap around the capillary bed and hold it in place. The podocytes, there's a lot of debate on how much influence they actually have, but when I was learning about this, they could squeeze and kind of tighten up to restrict how much stuff can co go pouring through there. It's the same idea. The only thing that's really being filtered are based on size. How fast you filter it would, would be how, f how much the podocytes affect their size or their distance apart. So three layers. The first one is the endothelial lining, the fenestration or capillary pores. Next is that base membrane, and then the third one is the podocytes, the foot cells. And then once something filters through here, what area is this in here? So it went through, now it's through the glomerulus. What's it in now? Yep, it's in the Bowman's capsule out here. What's the F word for the name of the substance that is now the yellow stuff? Filter. Filtrate. You have to filtrate. It's pre-urine. It's not technically urine yet. It has kind of a yellowy color because basically it's filtered plasma. It's a similar color to plasma right now. Things that can't get through are things that are bigger than a protein. So would a, um, would a single amino acid be bigger than a protein? No. We learn in digestion that amino acids are part of a protein. It's one little piece of a protein. Amino acids can slide through here and get in the filtrate. Do you want to lose those? No, you worked really hard to get that in your diet, so you need to pull it back in. Other things like sugar. How about um, cells? you think a whole cell can slide through here? Well, whole cells are like millions of proteins. If one protein can't slide through, can whole cells slide through? No. So things like red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, big fragments of proteins, um, even like albumin that's floating through your body. It's a protein. It doesn't slide through. It doesn't get filtered through. Only small particles go through this. So three steps getting through. And I think I listed everything. Yeah. 
endothelial cells, the base membrane, and then the uh, podocytes. Now you have that filtrate, that purified plasma. So in order for a substance to be filtered, it has to pass through all the following except which one, which does it not have to pass through. <coughs> How about number one, does it pass through filtration slit? Yep. How about the capillary pores? Yep. Or fenestrations. And then the base membrane, what was that? That was the stuff that was like cotton candy, yeah, it's the glycoproteins. And then the just glomerular apparatus, was that one of the three? No, that's just the general area that has the bone's capsule, it has the glomerulus in it, it has the afferent arterial, it has all those pieces. It, it's not doing filtration, these three do filtration. All right, you need stars by these. These were talked about once before, now they're back. So, filtration and reabsorption forces. Which one's pulling things into the blood or adding to the blood? Filtration or reabsorption? Always look at the blood as your point of reference. If you're taking things away from the blood, you're taking it away from the blood. If you're adding it to, you're reabsorbing it or absorbing it into the blood. So filtration pulls things out of the blood. Absorption or reabsorption pulls it back in. So the first one is glomerular capillary blood pressure. This is the capillaries itself, the pressure in the capillaries. Do you think those are going to pull things into the blood or squeeze things out of the blood? It's out of the blood. It's like turning up the faucet on your garden hose. The higher you turn the faucet, the more it pushes water out of your garden hose. The higher the blood pressure going into the glomerulus, the more blood it's going to push out of the garden hose, the glomerulus. So would this be a positive or negative value? Would it be adding to the blood or taking away from the blood? It's taking it away. It's taking things away from the blood. This is a negative value. Next is Bowman's capsule colloid osmotic pressure. Colloids referring to what things? Solutes. So you can refer, let it refer to proteins. You can let it refer to um, large substances like big pieces of sugar. In general, should proteins be able to slide through bone or through the glomerulus into Bowman's capsule? No. So what value should this always have in a healthy person? Zero. It should be zero. If somebody were sick and proteins were leaking through, and now they have proteins, those proteins are pulling things out of the blood. Would that be adding to, or I guess I answered my own question, would that be an adding or a subtracting value? Subtracting, so that's a negative value. Both of these things take things out of the blood. This one forces or pushes things out of the blood. This one pulls things out of the blood. These are both negative values. So of the four forces, if two are negative, guess what these two are? These are positives. So what are they doing? Are they taking away from the blood or adding things to the blood? They're adding. Another way of looking at adding is preventing them from being lost. So it doesn't necessarily have to be sucking it back into the blood, but it could be preventing it from leaving the blood in the first place. And the first one is blood, colloid, osmotic pressure. Those are solutes in the blood, like proteins in the blood. The albumin I just mentioned. The more albumin you have in your blood, the more water stays in your blood and doesn't go into your kidney. Like around, um, or right before ovulation in women, estrogen starts cranking up albumin in their blood. What's that cause them to do? Start retaining water. It pulls more water into their blood. What's it do to their blood pressure right before ovulation then? If they have higher blood volume, they must have higher blood pressure. So blood colloid osmotic pressure is pulling things into. It's trying to retain water in the blood. It's trying to prevent filtration. So this would be a positive value. It's trying to add things to the blood or hold things into the blood. And then the last one, Bowman's capsule hydrostatic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure, I think of it this way. If Bowman's capsule is a water balloon and the glomerulus is the faucet, as you turn the faucet on a trickle, the balloon will start filling, but there's going to come a point where the balloon stops filling. Why? because the pressure on the walls of the balloon are starting to push back equally as hard to push back into the faucet. So if you just have a little trickle, you're going to have to blow the water balloon apart. It'll go to a certain point and then it'll actually stop. So this is what this force is. The hydrostatic pressure is when Bowman's capsule gets full, it tries pushing water back up and into the blood. Would that be, a, would that be taking away from the blood or adding to the blood? It's adding. So both of these are adding values. When you see these two, you put a negative sign in front of it. When you see these two, you put positive signs in front of it. 
And then what you have to do to find out the average filtration force at the glomerulus, so how much force is actually cleaning the blood, you take all four of those and add them together. So the first one, you're going to take the glomerular capillary blood pressure. This is the blood pressure in the cap capillaries. What affects your blood pressure? What creates blood pressure? I guess is the best way to say this. What creates blood pressure? There's one thing in your there's one thing in your body that creates pressure for blood. It's the heart. It starts it all. When the heart beats, it pushes blood forward. The heart beating is what creates this glomerular capillary blood pressure. Every time your heart beats, it pushes. So if you're afraid, what's going to happen to your heartbeat? Is it going to get milder or more stronger? It's going to get stronger. What's going to happen to this number? Will it get smaller or bigger? It's going to get bigger. It's going to have higher pressure. It's going to force more blood into the kidneys. So the capillary blood pressure, a few things that affect it, of course, the heart. Another one's because it has a wide afferent, wide pump going in, or blood vessel going in, and a small one coming out. The difference in these sizes means if you dump a bunch in, you have to slow how fast it comes out the other end. So as that blood spends more time in the glomerulus, it gets more time to filter and get cleaned and processed. So the heart itself pumping, and then the size of the blood vessels going into the glomerulus are factors. This is probably the most significant of the four factors, because this one can change literally in a heartbeat. So I scare you a little bit, you jump, your heart beats a little bit harder, whoosh, you push a little bit more blood into the kidneys and you make a little more tinkle. All right, the average pressure at the glomerulus for people is 55 millimeters of mercury. This is not your mean arterial pressure, it's not your average blood pressure, it's just the average pressure inside the kidney. 55 millimeters of mercury which is still pretty high when you think about these little capillaries that are only one cell thick trying to hold all that pressure in. Right? So right away, if you increase the blood pressure, and I mentioned this already, you increase the filtration rate. If I put more blood into the kidneys, I filter more. It usually stays at about 20% gets filtered, but if I put one liter in per minute, then that means 20% gets filtered. If I put two liters in per minute, I still get 20% filtered, but I've actually doubled the amount of the filtrate. This thing can change really rapidly, so it's the most significant of the four pressures because it changes really quick. And normal, healthy people, you just sitting there. Next is the Bowman's capsule colloid osmotic pressure. Oh, by the way, was this positive or negative? This is pushing stuff out of the blood. It's negative. This one's pulling stuff out of the blood. It's Bowman's capsule's substances, solute, it's trying to pull water out of the blood. Is that positive or negative? It's negative. So it favors filtration to negative value. It should be zero because what do you know about the proteins of Bowman's capsule? There should not be any, right? There shouldn't be any. Next to blood colloid osmotic pressure, these are the solutes inside the blood. What are they doing with water? Are they trying to push water out of the blood or pull it into the blood? Into, yep. So what would that be? Adding or subtracting? It's adding. So this one opposes filtration, which actually promotes reabsorption. Terminology sometimes gets a little bit tricky because they'll use the same term that really means, this, or two different terms that mean the same thing. To absorb something is opposing filtration. To reabsorb is opposing filtration. Anytime you're trying to bring things into the blood, you're opposing filtration. All right, so the blood colloid osmotic pressure, this stays pretty consistent because you don't lose protein. So whatever goes into the kidney, the number of proteins should actually come out of the kidney too, on the other side of the blood vessels. Shouldn't go into the urine, should not. All right, so, uh, where was I at? Pushing water back into the capillaries with the pressure on average about 30 millimeters of mercury. What did I say, positive or negative here? Positive, it's adding. It's adding back to the blood. And then Bowman's capsule hydrostatic pressure. This is when that balloon gets too full. It's trying to push the water back up and in. So is that adding or subtracting from the blood? It's adding. So as you fill up, as you put more fluid into Bowman's capsule, if Bowman's capsule can't get rid of it fast enough, it will start pushing it back, trying to add it back to the blood. So you have four additions, and, or sorry, two additions and two subtractions for four total pressures. And then, like I started to say earlier, you can add those four together and get something we call the net filtration force. 
So if you look at things that are favoring filtration, you have 55 plus zero, so 55 millimeters of mercury. And then the opposing filtration, you had 10 and 30, or 15 and 30, I'm sorry, which was 45. So you had a, had a what? Was that negative or positive 55? Negative 55, and then what's this? Positive, so your total here is that t negative or positive 10? It's negative. Do you want filtration? Yeah, absolutely, you want filtration. So having that negative number means you're pulling things out of the blood. How do you remember that with the kidney? Because the whole purpose of the kidney is to, well, the major purpose of the kidney is to pull toxins, pull things you don't want out of the blood. Get rid of them, push them into the urine and pee them out later. Okay, so overall, <coughs> should favor filtration, and we call that force the net filtration pressure, or the NFP. I think it's abbreviated from here on out as NFP. So you could probably count on one of these kind of questions being on the test again. There's one on the last one, there'll be one just like this on this one, revolving around, I mean maybe, revolving around the kidney. So look at your neighbor, I'll wait a whole minute on this one because there's adding and subtracting. Okay, so what GCBP, glomerular capillary blood pressure, is that pushing things into the blood or out? Pushing it out. So what do you put in front of the 25? Negative. Negative. How about Bowman's capsule colloid osmotic pressure? Yep, it's the, it's the potential proteins in Bowman's capsule that are pulling water out, so that's a negative. Is this a healthy person? No, there's something wrong with this person. So you have a negative and a negative. By the way, if you see those two negatives right away, what can you automatically assume? The next two are positives. So you've got negative 25, negative 5, and then you have positive 10 and positive 40. What's that come out to? Negative 25 and negative 5 is negative 30. Negative 30 plus 50 is 20. Is it positive or negative 20? Positive 20. So is it opposing filtration or favoring filtration? It's opposing filtration. How much pee is this person making? None. They're not making any. So their kidneys are not working. Their kidneys are going into, into, uh, into renal failure. So the answer is number one. 20 millimeters of mercury opposing filtration. And then GFR, definitely have to know what this is over and over and over again. Glomerular filtration rate is just telling you, rate's telling you the speed Filtration is just telling you how fast it filters. And glomerulus is telling you where it's at. So the GFR is just saying how fast you filter things through the glomerulus. And this depends on a lot of factors. And it's, there's a lot of variabilities. How big are those podocytes? So how wide are they apart? How thick is the basement membrane? How many glomeruli do you have? Lots of different factors go into it. So not a lot you have to memorize. In general, what they do is they just give it this thing called the coefficient, the filtration coefficient. This says that for you, you have this fixed normal value, this average value, right? So here, this average value, this coefficient, is multiplied by the net filtration pressure, which you saw before was 10. Was it negative or positive 10? Negative 10. So whatever this is will equal your GFR. Remember I told you this before. If you have an equal sign, anything you do on this side, what will you do to that side? Yep, you directly affect it. So in this situation, here you're multiplying these two things. What if I double my filtration pressure? What do you think is going to happen to the GFR? 
doubles with it. What if I cut the filtration pressure in half? What happens to GFR? Cuts in half. So here are a couple of numbers, and they're unrolling for a reason, because you, have, you actually have to know them. So normally about 20% of the blood that goes into the kidney gets filtered. That's it. 80% of the blood that goes into the kidney does not get cleaned at all. It just goes right back into circulation and goes back around again. So normally about 20% that goes in gets filtered. And that 10 millimeters mercury filtration pressure we talked about, we added that up. That was our net filtration pressure. And I think this is kind of interesting. So if you do the math based on 5.5 liters of blood and 20% gets filtered and how fast everything moves, you'd actually calculate that 180 liters get filtered every day. That means every day, through your body, you can fill 92 liter bottles worth of filtrate. That's a lot of pr potential pee. Uh, I don't pee that much. I'm hoping you don't. Actually, I think with all of us combined, we probably don't pee that much in one day. But that's how much gets, how much pre-urine filtrate gets made in your body every day. So if you make that much, why is it you don't pee that much out? What has to happen? You reabsorb. Yep, and it's because you reabsorb. You'll reabsorb about 178.5 liters. So in reality, you only pee out about one and a half liters every day. Sorry, urinate out. Micturate. So you make about 180 liters, but you only actually urinate about one and a half liters out. If you take that 180 liters throughout the day and you broke it down, every minute you're making about 125 milliliters of filtrate, if you're a guy, and about 115 if you're a woman. A little bit less blood, so 20%. And then this, I've already told you, was kind of significant. So changes in the GFR occur primarily as a result of the glomerular capillary blood pressure. Of those four forces, only one of them has a huge impact on GFR. The other three can change in a disease state, but regular day-to-day -day function, there's only one that really changes. And it can change in a heartbeat, in a millisecond, if I scare you, poof, suddenly the blood pressure of the kidney changes. <clears throat> okay, so regulating the GFR. And then I, I just said this probably the third or fourth time, the glomerular capillary blood pressure is the one that is the biggest factor. It's the one that's controlled. You can affect this by your heart rate, you can affect it by the blood volume, you can affect it based on how big the afferent arterial is going into the glomerulus. All those things can affect it. Your sympathetic nervous system can adjust the size of blood vessels and affect it. All lightning fast. The other three, the Bowman's cat or colloid osmotic pressure, the hydrostatic pressure, they don't change that much. Even the amount of albumin that's in the blood doesn't change that much. So again, it's the blood pressure is the big factor. So now I know what changes it, how does it change? First you have autoregulation. What organ are we talking about? The kidney. So what's autoregulation? It's when what's controlling the kidney? It's the kidney. Kidney controlling the kidney. The kidney has short-term control, very short-term. It's basically a self-defense mechanism. If the kidney is getting too much blood at one time and you jack up your blood pressure super high, you don't want to blow out all the glomeruli in your kidney, so the kidney will actually constrict its own blood vessels down and restrict its blood flow. It's protective, but it's a short-term mechanism. So if you have really high blood pressure, like if you jump on a treadmill and you start running full bore as fast as you possibly can, your kidneys will actually start clamping down the blood vessels to themselves so that they don't blow out. That's why if you're, if you're a runner, if you've ever noticed, if you start running, you don't have to pee until you're done, unless it's in like the first five minutes and then you should have gone before you got on the treadmill or out on the track. It's because when you're running hard and you have the adrenaline pumping, the kidneys are actually not working very much. They're shutting their blood flow down. It's to protect the kidneys. Short term, how long do you really run for? Days? What, Evs? <laughs> like, three minutes, whatever. So maybe an hour if you're running a marathon, four or five hours, but not that long. So this is short term, very short term. And then second, extrinsic. So extrinsic means what's controlling the kidney? Anything but the kidney. What are the two primary controllers of all the other organs? Nervous system and the endocrine. So when I say sympathetic control, 
doesn't matter actually in this situation what hormone or neurotransmitter are you going to focus on? Adrenalines, right? Noradrenaline or norepinephrine and epinephrine, and the adrenalines. Right? These are better for long-term regulation. Unfortunately, when you have stress that's causing high blood pressure, that stress releases adrenaline, and that adrenaline goes to your kidneys and does what to the blood flow of the kidneys? What did I just say it does? decreases the blood flow. So if you're consistently stressed out and consistently or chronically have high blood pressure, what's always happening to the blood flow in the kidney? It's always decreased. And the blood flow of the kidney, number one, is cleaning the blood, which is a bad thing. Number two is the kidney still needs blood to survive. So people with chronic high blood pressure a lot of times will actually get renal symptoms because of their disease. It harms the, the kidney. So short term is auto regulation, long term is more extrinsic or sympathetically controlled. Okay, so the R regulation altering the afferent arterioles what the primary goal is. If you adjust the size of the afferent arterial, you adjust the flow. And you already know that because of this equation down here. Flow equals pressure divided by resistance. We've seen this so many times, it's just ridiculous at this point. But if I, what's your gut tell you? Let's say that I jump on a treadmill and I'm running really hard and adrenaline comes out. What's it going to do to that blood vessel, the afferent arterial? Squeeze it. Your gut instinct should say that it's going to constrict the blood vessels because to every, everywhere except the heart and the brain, you're going to constrict all of those blood vessels. So what's, going to, what's your gut instinct about the flow going into the kidney? It's going to decrease. Right, so what are these autoregulators? Myogenic. What's that mean? You've seen it before, I know two other times. Muscle generated. What kind of muscle is in the kidney? Skeletal, cardiac, or smooth? Smooth, yep, it's all smooth. Cardiac, of course, in the heart, and skeletal is when you're connecting to bones and fascia. So myogenic is smooth muscle changes. Myogenic, or that smooth muscle, is just like in the stomach that we talked about before. So if I have a fast, a dramatic change in pressure, What's the myogenic response? Big change rapidly stretches out that smooth muscle around that afferent arterial. What's it going to do instinctively? Snap back, right? You know that. All the way back to that milk chug thing. You fill up the stomach too fast, the fast expansion causes it to want to recoil and vomit. Blood vessels are like that, even the blood vessels in the kidney. And next is the tubi ugh, little stuffy nose. Tubuloglomerular feedback mechanism. This one's important. This is where we're coming back to that juxtaglomerular apparatus. Not like the last one wasn't important, but this one takes a little bit more detail because it's actually kind of a machine, the way it works. It's not just like a smooth muscle that it, you pinch it and it responds. This actually takes a little bit of processing. So going back to that whole juxtaglomerular apparatus, that's all the stuff that's around the afferent arterial, basically. The afferent arterial, the glomerulus, the Bowman's capsule that wraps around this outside. Right? I forgot I had these pictures. These are actually for smooth muscle. So let's say I have blood flow going in the afferent. How do I know this is the afferent and that's the efferent, by the way, in this picture? Afferent's bigger, right? So I have a certain amount of blood flow going through here. I have an increase in blood flow. What should I automatically assume is going to happen to my filtration rate? More blood flow in means more blood is going to get filtered, which means increase the filtration rate, which is GFR. So more blood flow goes in, more filtration pressure, more filtration rate. How, if I rapidly do this, how is this kidney or this glomeruli going to respond? Will it dilate this or constrict it? Rapid increase in pressure. What's, it, what's its instinct? Constrict. So it pinches off. What happens to the flow when I constrict this? And hopefully you know this by now. If you decrease the radius, what do you do to resistance? increase the resistance. If you increase the resistance, what do you do to flow? Decrease the flow. So now it turns down the filtration pressure. It turns down the filtration rate. And what do you know about my urine production? It goes down. In fact, what's interesting is that now that I'm pushing less fluid through here, what process do I get a chance to do more further down the tubules? reabsorb, right? What's going to happen to my urine if I'm reabsorbing a lot of water and nutrients? It's going to get very, very concentrated. Yeah. 
very concentrated. It's going to look what color? Very clear or very yellow? Very yellow. Right. And then it, if this happens for a while, based on our regulation, let's say you get on the treadmill, and then you get off the treadmill, your blood pressure drops down to normal, then of course this is going to open back up. What's going to happen to your, your pressure going through here when you open this? When you open this up, the pressure will go back up. What happens to your filtration rate? goes back up with it. What happens to your urine production after that? Now you go back to normal. You start increasing your urine production so you bring it back up to par. Right. Flow charts. So if I have an increase in blood pressure, the response instantly from the afferent arterial is if you have high blood pressure, it wants to shut it back down, right? So you have higher blood pressure, higher pressure in the glomerulus. The glomerulus is thinking, holy crap, we're going to blow out. Okay. Its filtration pressure is getting up too high, so what's it going to do instinctively? Squeeze down on the blood vessels. So it's going to stimulate these cells called the macula densa cells that we talked about the first day of the kidney. The macula densa cells are going to release a vasoactive chemical. What's that vasoactive chemical going to do? Is it going to constrict or dilate the blood vessels? It's going to constrict the blood vessels. Yep. So it causes vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction decreases the radius, increasing resistance, decreasing flow, and then your pressure comes back down to normal, and your filtration rate gets back down to normal. Right. Sympathetic control. What's sympathetic control? What organ? It's the brain. So the brain, the medulla oblongata, when you're talking about sympathetic and parasympathetic, is parasympathetic going to have any influence over the blood vessels? What did I say that should have give, been the giveaway? Parasympathetic and blood vessels. Yeah, so parasympathetic has nothing to do with the blood vessels until the last week of class. Okay, so sympathetic uh, goes out of the afferent arterioles. If it releases norepinephrine on the arterial, you automatically can assume it's going to do what to it? If the sympathetic nervous system dumps adrenaline onto a blood vessel, you can automatically assume it's going to do what to it? Constrict it. Yep. So it constricts it. When does this happen? It happens when your blood volume goes down. Why would you want blood flow to the kidney to go down if your blood volume overall has gone down in the body? What's, what's your body trying to do? Conserve water. Yeah, it's trying to conserve water and also give you t more time to reabsorb the water. So one of the main causes is a decrease in blood volume or a decrease in blood... What usually goes hand in hand with the volume? Blood volume and blood pressure. Either of those will do the same thing. So a drop in volume or a drop in blood pressure, both turn the sympathetic nervous system on. That's SNS. SNS releases adrenaline onto the afferent arterial and squeezes it, decreasing the flow, which means you have more time to reabsorb the water and you lose less. Your urine gets really, really thick. Or if you're going into shock, guess what happens to your urine production overall? It shuts off. That's why when they worry about people going into shock, right away they start measuring their urine output. Okay, um, and then this can actually override the autoregulatory responses. So even though the kidney is going, man, you're, you're killing me, but you're not letting me get blood, the kidney can't overwhelm the sympathetic nervous system in this situation. So it can't say, well, I need more blood, I'm just going to open up. The brain actually has the final say in this. It can override the kidneys until the point where, 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 where are some of the first organs to shut down when somebody's in shock? The kidneys. Yep, kidneys in the liver are actually the first organs that start shutting down. Okay, so the whole role here, I'll walk you through the entire process. So the bare receptors are receptors that are sensitive to pressure. Where are they located? You know this. It was on the test. Not, it wasn't on the last test? It was on the last test. Aortic arch and carotid sinuses. So this all starts by pressure changes in the aortic arch and the carotid sinus. Either not enough blood's getting to the brain, or not enough pressure's getting to the brain, or not if pressure is getting the systemic circulation. It sends a signal to where? Is this life threatening? Blood pressure, is it life threatening? Yes, so where's your gut tell you to say? Medulla oblongata. So it sends a signal up to the medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata says, whoa, the blood pressure is too, we'll say low in the first example right here. Blood pressure is too low. What's the medulla oblongata do, got to do to the sympathetic nervous system? Turn it. Up. Yep, turns it up. So it turns up the sympathetic nervous system. 
which sends a signal down and dumps adrenaline into the blood, for one thing, from the adrenal gland, but it also sends a signal all the way to the afferent arterial and tells it to do what? Constrict. Blood volume or blood pressure drops, so it's constricting the blood vessel going into the kidney, so that what happens to filtrate production? It decreases. Yep. If you decrease the size of that blood vessel, you decrease the flow, you decrease um, the filtrate production. What happens to reabsorption rate? Kidney reabsorption rate. That goes up, bringing more water back into the blood to do what? Increase your blood volume, which increases the blood pressure. So that whole pathway came all the way back to the beginning. A low blood pressure stimulated the medulla oblongata, you release adrenaline into the system, adrenaline out of the afferent arterial, afferent arterial constricts, decreases the radius, increases the resistance, decreases the flow, decreases the filtration rate, increases the reabsorption, and overall your effect is to do what with blood volume? Bring it up, which did what to blood pressure? Brought it up with it. What kind of feedback loop is that? It's a negative feedback loop, it's classic one. So all we did there, it seemed like a long loop, but really most of that loop you understood from cardiovascular. All we're really doing now is directing it at the, uh, at the kidney. So if you know the whole process for low arterial blood pressure, what can you assume for high? It's exactly the opposite. So here's your example. You have a drop in blood pressure. I kind of already walked through this with you. Those barrel receptors detect it in the carotid arch and aortic, carotid arch and aortic sinus. Switch that, reverse it. Sympathetic activity goes up. What area is telling the sympathetic activity to go up? Medulla oblongata. <coughs> Excuse me. Raises cardiac output, raises your TPR, raising your blood pressure instantly. But now we're going to follow the kidney path down here. So you have vasoconstriction, the afferent ar arterial vasoconstricts. Your blood pressure inside the kidney goes down. Your filtration rate goes down. Your urine volume goes down, which means you pull more fluid into the body doing what to your blood volume? Bringing the blood volume back up, which does what to your pressure? brings pressure back up, which is reversing what happened in the very beginning. Negative feedback loop. <laughs> Alright, this is kind of cool about the kidney. So, they're about 1% of your entire body's weight, but they actually get about 20-25% to of every heartbeat. So, when your heart beats, what's that volume of blood that's pumped out in one beat? Stroke volume. About 20-25% to of every stroke volume actually goes to the kidney. Only 1% of the body. So when you look at the whole 5,000 milliliters or 5 liters, you can see that a huge chunk of it goes straight to the kidney right away to get clean, processed, filtered. <coughs> look, it's a step-by-step -step process. So that was filtration. Now we're going to switch over to reabsorption. And it's tubular reabsorption. So we've made the filtrate. Filtration's done. We've accidentally pushed important things in. We've pushed in sugar into our filtrate. We've pushed in amino acids, we've pushed in sodium, potassium, chloride, all these electrolytes or ions that we don't want to lose. We've pushed in water that we don't want to lose. And now we've got to get it back into the system. So we have to bring it back to the blood, and that's reabsorption. This process of trans epithelial transport is actually a five-step transport mechanism. So there's your glomerulus. You just filtered here, pushed it into the tubule. We're going to follow the tubule along. So here's the tubule. There's your yellow filtrate. And there are five steps that go across. The first one is that you bring it across what's referred to as the apical membrane. The apical means the top. Anything about the body, if you're here apical, it means closer to the surface. This is technically considered an external environment, just like the GI tract was external, because this has access to the outside. So you take it from this external environment, and you bring it across this apical membrane. Now it's inside the tubule cell. So step one is crossing the apical membrane. Step two is you go through, what's that liquid inside of a cell called? The cytoplasm. Yep, so now you have to distribute it across the cytoplasm. How does it move across there, do you think? Diffusion. Yep, just passive diffusion. If it's something like sodium, can sodium passively diffuse across the membrane? Nope, it has to have a transporter. It has a charge, so it has to have a transporter. So here we're going to have a transporter that brings it in, and then it passively diffuses across the cytoplasm. 
And then if it's sodium, it's interesting because you've seen this pathway before. What's happening right here? It's being, we talked about this in digestion. Exactly the same process, actually. You bring sodium in here with something else, like sodium and sugar come in. Sugar stays straight on the path, but sodium gets pumped, right? So here you pump sodium across the basolateral. Basal means the bottom part, lateral means the side. So you pump it across the basolateral membrane. So what kind of transport is this so far? This one's not active, but it's a transporter. This one is active. I feel bad because I'm actually pointing at the ear that I can't hear out toward you. So I'm going to assume that everybody goes, hey, it's secondary active. Good job. Secondary active transport on the basolateral membrane. And then it has to move across the interstitial space. So how do you think it moves across the interstitial space? Diffusion again. It accumulates here and diffuses downstream until it gets over here to the endothelial layer, and then it moves across and into the blood. So typically it moves through the pores, but it may need to be transported. Five steps. Apical surface, through the cytoplasm, basal lateral membrane, interstitial space, and then endothelial cells and into the plasma. So it took whatever that substance was that you don't want to get rid of and brings it back into the blood so that it's useful. Okay, so let's talk about the individual things that you have to remember to get moved back in. So things like water, glucose, sodium, they're reabsorbed indiscriminately. They just get pulled back and pulled back in. As fast as you can pull it in, it pulls it in. They're indiscriminate. Your body doesn't want to lose any sodium. It doesn't like to lose sodium. Same thing with sugar. Should you have sugar in your urine? No, the only time you see sugar in your urine is if you have diabetes or if you have some kind of problem that's causing you to have high blood sugar, which actually I guess I could have just said that instead of diabetes. Like, what else could cause you to have a spike in blood sugar? For some reason I feel like this usually happens right around Easter because I always use the same example. If you ate a bag of jelly beans, right? So if you ate a bunch of sugary things, you start bringing all that sugar in from your GI tract, you feel that spike in your blood sugar, or if you drink a you know, soda really quick, all that high fructose corn syrup that shoots straight in your bloodstream because that spike in sugar, sometimes you'll actually see some of that sugar pass through and out of the kidney. All right. And then urea is interesting because urea you really don't want to keep, but we'll call this an evolutionary flaw. About half of it actually gets reabsorbed. Your body actually intentionally reabsorbs half of that urea. And there's no really good reason for that. This is one of those fluky flaws that I have no explanation for. All right, so two types of tubular reabsorption. You have passive and active. Passive means that you, what process it starts with a D? Yep, diffusion. So it's diffusion or it's just a passive transport. And then the other one's active means you require ATP. Almost everything you learned about the GI tract, where you're talking passive and active, applies exactly the same here, which is kind of nice the way that the digestive system sits right next to the urinary system. It's nice to group or chunk pieces of information together. So sodium, when you look at it, is transported exactly like in the GI tract. It's moved by a sodium potassium ATPase, which is an enzyme. Is that active or passive? Active. Yep, it's active. And that pumps on the basolateral membrane that I was just talking about earlier. So it's exactly like what we talked about in the GI tract. You pump it across this membrane so that it can passively move over here. In reality, it's secondary active. All right. About 80% of all the energy the kidney uses is focusing on sodium. That's how important sodium is to you. You want sodium. Uh, unfortunately, with our diets, we get way too much of it in. But you want sodium because it helps you maintain blood pressure. It helps maintain electrical properties in your body. The first week of class, we talked about neurons, and sodium was one of the most important electrolytes when it came to neurons. What does it do for a neuron? Does it repolarize, depolarize? I'm just wondering how much brain dump you get test to test. It's depolarizes, right? What's the ion that repolarizes? Potassium, almost all the time, right? In fact, in this class, we don't even talk about exceptions. It's always potassium in this class. All right, so now percentages. So 80% of the energy went into reabsorbing, but where the sodium is reabsorbed is really important. Almost 100% is pulled back in, but in specific areas. 67% is pulled in right away in the proximal tubule. Remember, 
you filter into the Bowman's capsule, and then as soon as that stuff gets into the proximal tubule, about 67% of the sodium is pulled right back in. You're going to find this for most of the things that are reabsorbed in the kidney, most of them are reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. So general rule of thumb, if you're asked, where is this a reabsorbed primarily, go for proximal tubule. If you're reabsorbing sugar, it's all reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. If you're reabsorbing um, potassium, almost all of it's reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. If you're reabsorbing amino acids, all of it's absorbed in the proximal tubule. If you're reabsorbing sodium, 67% reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. So it's kind of funny because you dump 20% of your blood into the Bowman's capsule and then right away you're pulling back you know, 67% of sodium, 100% of the sugar, blah, blah, blah. Roughly about 80% of what just got filtered gets pulled right back into the blood anyway. I was thinking my sister when she cleans her purse. Since most of you are women, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? You clean your purse, but what do you do? You dump the whole damn thing out, and then you flip it over, and you put 80% of the crap right back in, right? And if you're my sister, you leave the 20% on the table for my mom to throw away later. But anyway, that's what the kidney does. Remember, it's dumping 180 liters of fluid into the Bowman's capsule every day, but it's pulling back almost all of it, 178.5 of those liters. Most of it's coming back in the proximal tubule. All right. Next, the ascending loop of Henle. 25% in the ascending loop of Henle's where sodium is being reabsorbed. How much was in the descending loop? None, which is important. Zero sodium is absorbed in the descending loop. None of it. Water is absorbed in the descending loop, but no sodium. Right? So in other words, you've got this proximal tubule, 67% is pulled out of the proximal tubule, and this starts descending down. How much sodium is pulled out in the descending loop? None. Sodium stays consistent all the way down deep into the medulla of the kidney, and then as it starts coming back up the other side, then you start reabsorbing some more sodium. So coming down, it's pulling water back into your blood. Going back up, it's pulling salt back into your blood, but not water. It's interesting because they alternate. You only move one at a time. And then the last 8%, this is the flexible amount. These are fixed, 67%, 25%, but this one, around 8%, up to 8%, it can be as little as 0% here. And the distal tubule in the collecting ducts. These are the last steps of that tubular component. Once it's past this, it's urine. There's no changing it at that point. Once you get the stuff into your bladder, it's fixed. It doesn't change. This last spot, as it's coming all the way at the very end of the tubule process, it gets monitored and regulated and goes, wow, do we have enough salt in our body? If you have too much salt in your body, you're not going to reabsorb that salt. You'll just urinate it out. If you have very little salt in your body, you're going to absorb all 8%. It fluctuates depending on how, you're, how much need you have for salt. Like if you just ate a bag of pretzels, what would that be closer to? If you just ate a bag of pretzels, would you want to reabsorb 8% or 0%? Zero. You just cranked all the salt in your blood. You want to get rid of some of that salt, so you start peeing it out. All right. And the influence, what controls this, is this process called renin-angiotensin-aldosterone mechanism. Sometimes you'll see it called the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, the RAAS. I heard somebody from a nursing class the other day just called it RAA. So whatever it is, it's super important. And obviously, if I just said somebody in a nursing class said it, you're going to have to know it if you go into nursing. But this is super important, not even if you go into nursing. If you go on to be a doctor or if you become a biomedical scientist, it doesn't matter because this mechanism is super important in blood pressure issues. When about half of us in here are going to have high blood pressure issues at some time of our, in our life, or I guess low blood pressure, that matter too, this is going to be one of the mechanisms they're going to try and manipulate to save you. Right? So here are two hormones you're going to have to know. The first one's called aldosterone. And the next one's called ANP, atrial natriuretic peptide. These two work against each other. And we're going to go into better detail, actually several times from here on out, on these two. Aldosterone makes you retain sodium. ANP makes you lose sodium. Every time I see this word natriuretic, I always look at the first three letters and they look to me like Na plus. Why do I see those three letter, those three things when I look at this? Because I want to think sodium, right? When I see atrial natriuretic, natriuretic sounds like what? A diuretic, which makes you do what? 
pee things out, right? What specifically are you trying to pee out here? Sodium. So this is a hormone that makes you pee out sodium. The other one helps you retain sodium. And again, this isn't the only time you're going to see them, and you're going to have to know a lot more detail than this later. Okay, so here's just how sodium looks. This is close up. So we took that last slide, a couple slides back, and just blew it up. Here's the tubule lumen. You pull the sodium in over here. Once it's inside of this, it starts accumulating. But to keep it moving constantly, what you do is you keep pumping it out this membrane. So you pump the sodium over here. Sodium accumulates here, diffuses across the interstitial fluid, moves across the endothelial layer and into the blood, and you carry it away. Have you ever seen this pump before? Every time that you've seen sodium, you've seen what moving with it? Potassium. I, sh I actually shouldn't say with it. What? How does potassium move compared to sodium? Opposite of it. Yeah, so as you're actually retaining sodium, guess what you're pushing out into the urine? Potassium. Which is really interesting because when you start getting into electrolyte imbalances, um, which we won't go into that much detail in this class, but in like pathophysiology or pharmacology and stuff like that, you'll find that when people have things like too much sodium, what a lot of times will they actually have as a result of having too much sodium? Too little potassium, or vice versa. Yeah, you see these fluctuations. It's really crazy how that works. All right, you should put a big box around this with a big smiley face or an uh-oh face because, uh-oh, I've got to know this. <clears throat> this is a feedback loop. So guess what kind of feedback loop it'll be. Yeah, I didn't get to finish it. We're gonna, I'll talk about how it's a negative feedback loop. So this renin angiotensin aldosterone system or mechanism, it's written out in your book. It's written out with a picture like this. I love the picture. I like pictures because I can see the picture, memorize it, and then when I get a test that is important like this, I just sketch the picture real quick on my, my test so I can remember it. Does anybody ever do that? Whatever the hardest thing, wherever you found the hardest thing to learn is, that's the last thing you want to look at before you go into the test, and as soon as you get the book, what do you do? Flip the test over, write everything you know about that one thing on the back of the booklet, and then forget it. Just let it go, and then start taking the test. Anybody do that? Oh, it frees up your mind. Otherwise, you're obsessed with this one thing and hoping that that question's on the test the whole time and you're totally out of it. So this is going to be one of those things you might want to get used to. Okay, so here's how it works. It starts with something like a drop in sodium chloride, so having low sodium, or having low extracellular fluid volume, which means your plasma volume drops, or your interstitial fluid volume drops, which brings your plasma down or a drop in blood pressure, which in reality, all these things go hand in hand. If you have a drop in sodium in your blood, your blood volume drops and your blood pressure drops. So they're all connected. The big goal here is primarily the blood pressure because what do you think is determining this? What kind of structures are trying to measure this all the time? I'll give you a hint. It's a type of receptor. It's a baroreceptor, yep, and you know where they're at, right? Aortic arch, carotid sinus. So we're going to start off with, you have a drop in blood pressure. That drop in blood pressure is detected, or si you have a signal that's detected by the kidney, and the kidney's going to release a chemical called renin. So renin gets dumped out, but renin actually doesn't do very much at all. It doesn't affect your blood pressure directly. It just goes circulating through your system. It needs to find a partner, and what it's looking for is a partner called angiotensin ogen. What do you know about this already without me saying anything? It's inactive. It's an enzyme that's inactive. It's made by the liver and it's just constantly flowing through your blood. It's just like those albumins that are always floating around there. Angiotensin can carry things like steroids and hormones. It can transport things in your body when it's not doing anything better. So now renin is going to find this angiotensin gen in the blood. They stick together and what it does is renin will cleave off the ending of the angiotensin O gen and make it something called angiotensin 1, which luckily is not very active at all. So it's not really doing anything. It's kind of like having a hand grenade with two pins. Renin pulls the first pin. The second pin, this angiotensin will go up and into the lungs. As it's flowing through the capillaries in the lungs, it gets activated by a special enzyme that's only in the lungs called angiotensin converting enzyme. Or we call it ACE for short. How many people think they know where I'm going by telling you to write down ACE? Anybody here ever heard of an ACE inhibitor? Who takes those? People with high blood pressure. 
So this angiotensin 1 goes into the lungs and gets activated by ACE. ACE converts it from angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. This one, you should put a star by because angiotensin 2 is the active, the extremely explosive version of this hormone. So it started as angiotensinogen, and then went to angiotensin 1, and then it was finally turned into angiotensin 2. But look at all these pathways that are coming off of angiotensin 2. It's active. One thing it's going to do is it's going to go to the adrenal gland, the adrenal cortex, and release a chemical called aldosterone. What did aldosterone do? I just told you this like five minutes ago. Make sure you retain salt, right? What was the first thing in this whole pathway? What kicked this whole all off? Either you had low salt, low volume, or low blood pressure. So right now, you're going to release a hormone, a second hormone, that causes you to retain salt. What do you know what happens to water when you retain salt? You retain water, too, right? Where salt goes, water flows. So now, right away, just by releasing aldosterone, what's going to start happening to your blood pressure? Yep, you retain water, your, your blood volume goes up, which means your blood pressure goes up with it. So right away, this one step is bringing your blood pressure up. But angiotensin II also goes and releases something called vasopressin from the hypothalamus. Anytime you see vasopressin, I need you to write three letters by it. A, D, H. It has a second name called antidiuretic hormone. I hate it when they do this. You have to know both of them. I hate it when they do this because this is how scientists work. They're egos. Um, there was a group of cardiologists and a group of urologists that were studying this hormone at the same time. And the cardiologists were looking at it and they went, wow, this hormone causes vas vessel constriction, vasopressin. It squeezes the blood vessels and raises the blood pressure. The urologists released a paper at the same time to say, hey, look at this hormone that will actually cause you to do what? It's an anti-diuretic. So what's it cause you to do? What's a diuretic make you do? P, so an anti-diuretic makes you retain water. If you retain water, what happens to your blood volume? It goes up. What happens to your blood pressure? It goes up. It doesn't matter which way you look at it. They both had this final effect, but these two groups of scientists actually gave it two totally different names. It's the same hormone, just two names. So vasopressin and ADH are the same. And what did I just tell you they do? Yep, it, in two different ways it will raise blood pressure. One way it retains water, the other way it just squeezes blood vessels. So now there are three things that are happening that are raising blood, blood pressure. Aldosterone is making you retain salt. Vasopressin is making you retain water. Vasopressin is also squeezing your blood vessels. All three raise your blood pressure. One hormone, three results now. Angiotensin II also goes to the where, what part of the brain regulates thirst? I'll give you a hint. I just said it. Hypothalamus. Yep. So it goes to the hypothalamus and releases vasopressin, but it also makes you thirsty, making you do what? Bring in more water. Where's that water go? Into your blood, doing what your blood volume, making you go up, making your blood pressure go up. Four ways it's raised your blood pressure. Then the last one is the angiotensin II itself can just go straight to the blood vessels and start constricting them. So five ways altogether it raises your blood pressure. So when, when scientists were looking for a way to lower blood pressure, that was the first hormone they wanted to try and work with. So by blocking this hormone's activation, you turn off five mechanisms that raise blood pressure. So if somebody has high blood pressure and you reduce how much angiotensin they create, then you can actually lower their blood pressure pretty easily. Okay, so that's the renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism. The initial stimuli was a drop in blood pressure, a drop in salt, or a drop in blood volume. The final effect is to do what to all those three things? Raise them all, shutting off the loop. <coughs> all right. So the complete absence of aldosterone, if you didn't have any aldosterone, you'd actually pee at about 20 grams of salt. So part of a salt shaker. Next time you're low in salt, just uh, yeah, pee in a cup and dehydrate it and sprinkle it on your tomatoes. I don't know where I come with the stupid stuff. Anyway, with maximum aldosterone secretion, all of the salt that you put into your filtrate is pulled back in. You lose no salt in the urine. It's just lots of waste products, but no salt. Aldosterone controls that last what percent of sodium resor reabsorption? The 67? 
the this is right, 6725 and what was the last one? The 8%. It's the 8%. Where was that affected at? Where's aldosterone work at? Proximal, descending, ascending, or the distal? Yep, it's the distal and the collecting duct. And usually when you hear distal and collecting duct, they're right together. <coughs> so which one's true about the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system? How about number one? How about renin is released from the adrenal gland when blood pressure is elevated? Is renin released from the adrenal gland? Nope, renin is released from the kidney. When is renin released? When the blood pressure is elevated? No, when the blood pressure is dropped or lowered. So everything about number one is wrong. Number two. How angiotensin angiotensin one stimulates aldosterone release from the kidneys. <coughs> what stimulates aldosterone release from the kidneys? Should I let's break that down. What stimulates aldosterone release? Angiotensin two from the where did aldosterone come from? Now the kidneys, just above. The adrenal cortex, the adrenal glands. Yep, so everything about number two is wrong. Number three, angiotensin elgin is made in the kidney. Where was angiotensinogen made? Made in the liver. So hopefully number four is right. Angiotensin one is converted to angiotensin two in the lungs. By what? Angiotensin converting enzyme, which is ACE. Yep, number four is our right answer. Okay, so that those couple hormones again, A and P, atrial natriuretic peptide. Guess where this is made? One of my favorite things about anatomy is that a lot of the names we give things either tell you what it does, or it tells you where it comes from, or where it connects to. Guess where this comes from? The atria. So what organ? The heart. Yep, it comes from the heart. Atrial natriuretic peptide is made in the heart and it's released when your blood pressure is too high. So what it does is it blocks your ability to reabsorb sodium, which makes you pee out sodium and also makes you pee out... So indirectly, it's making you pee out water. Why would the heart want to do that? Why would the heart want you to pee out sodium and water to decrease blood pressure? I, I love it when things make sense because to me, this is, this is a safety switch for the heart. If the heart has too much blood pressure going on inside of it, it's protecting itself. Chronic high blood pressure is really, really bad on your heart and can cause heart failure. So when the heart experiences this high blood pressure, it releases this hormone that goes to the kidney and says, man, you're killing me here. Just dump some of this salt out and some of this water out so we can bring our blood pressure back down. So A and P works directly against what hormone that we've been talking about. A and P blocks sodium reabsorption. What was the name of the hormone that causes sodium reabsorption? It starts with an A also. Aldosterone. <coughs> right. And then I just mentioned this release from the cardiac atria where there's stretch because there's high pressure. Okay, so A and P inhibits renin release and also, which, well, in reality, blocks aldosterone secretion too. So if you're looking, A and P is kind of like the anti, well, obviously anti-aldosterone, but it's kind of the anti-angiotensin um, 2 because it does lots of things to lower blood pressure. So you have high blood pressure, high sodium, high volume, whatever is going to raise your blood pressure. And then it's going to release A and P that goes down and blocks sodium reabsorption. It blocks the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. It causes smooth... <coughs> excuse me, smooth blood vessels to dilate 
which is going to make you do what to filtrate? Make more or make less? If you open up the blood vessels going into the glomerulus, what's going to happen to the filtration rate? More filtration, right? So you're going to push more fluids out into the urine. What's that doing to your blood volume? Dropping it, or your blood pressure. And then it's also going to inhibit the sympathetic nervous system. So it's going to try and relax, again, the blood vessels. Okay. And then the last nutrients and electrolytes. So glucose and amino acids are absorbed by sodium dependent. These are exactly like the GI tract, like I keep saying. Amino acids and glucose are pulled in with sodium, and then sodium is transport, transported on the other side of the membrane. Chloride reabsorption. Chloride likes to follow sodium. How do you know that? Because when you put sodium and chloride together, they stick together, they make table salt. They just naturally want to bind together. So wherever sodium wants to go, chloride wants to go with it. You learn that back in the neuron section, too. Wherever sodium goes, water wants to flow with it. Sodium helps increase urea reabsorption. About what percent of urea is reabsorbed? About half of it. What's unfortunate is that the older you get, the harder it is for you to get rid of urea. Your kidneys don't work the way they used to, and urea builds up, and it turns into something called uric acid, which causes what disease, do you know? Gout, yeah. Does uric acid will actually turn to crystals in your joints. Anywhere that your body's cold, it'll start forming these little things called tophi in your joints, which are actual crystals accumulating there. So just imagine your joints filled with like sand, sand-like crystals. How painful that would be. All right, then unwanted waste products like phenocreatinine, or just you can think creatinine in general. As your body, where's creatinine coming from? What kind of tissues? Muscle. Yeah, when you normally walk across the room or you work out or you do any kind of day-to-day -day living, when you're moving muscles, you're actually squeezing some creatinine out of those muscles and into your blood, and your kidney will help you clear it. So you normally push out creatinine. It's just when you have severe damage to the muscles, you see huge spikes like heart attacks or um, crush sy syndrome. So again, you can just see the membranes. Here's water chasing sodium. As sodium gets pulled across, the water chases after it, moves out of the interstitial fluid, and it moves into the blood. It's following sodium the entire time. Here's some examples of how things are filtered. So you get filtered. Let's say you filter 125 pieces here. As that floats along, some of it gets pulled back through what process? Reabsorption. So you go from the 125 pieces, so we'll say we cut it down to 44 pieces, and that's what you see coming out in the urine. As you absorb any solutes, it doesn't matter if it's sodium or anything else, as you absorb the solutes, the water naturally wants to chase it. So as you're pulling the solutes out, you're also pulling water with it. And what's the diffusion of water? Which was actually up there. Osmosis, yeah. Okay, tubular maximum. Tubular maximum is kind of a, a cool little idea. When you're trying to move certain things, you have a limited number of transporters for moving it. So if I have 50 transporters across the front of the room, and they each move one bucket of water per minute, and I put 10 buckets of water worth of water along the wall, will they move all that water? Think if this were a dam, and this were a village. We had 50 buckets of water here, and we had 10 that overflowed into our town. Can we clear those? 10 buckets of water? Heck yeah. How about if we had 40 buckets? Can we move them all? Yeah, we have 50 buckets of transporters, right? What if we had 51 buckets of water that flowed into our town? Can we move them all efficiently? Nope, we're going to have one bucket of water left over. The maximum amount that you hit, that 50, is called tubular maximum. Whatever the number of transporters you have to move a substance is called your tubular maximum. Like, for instance, sugar. You have a certain number of transporters in your, in your kidney that can move sugar. If you put a little sugar in your kidney, zoop, you pull it right back in. If you put a little bit more sh sugar in your kidney, zoop, you, you pull those back in. But if you put too much sugar in the kidney, it's overwhelmed, and some of that sugar will actually flow out into your urine. So tubular maximum is the maximum amount of substance you can actually transport in a certain amount of time. Okay. Real thresholds, what you call it when you exceed that number. <coughs> so here's the way your book illustrates it. So let's say your plasma concentration of, in your blood is 80 milligrams of sugar per 100 milliliters, right, which is 
an average blood sugar. So about 80 milligrams per milliliter. If you're filtering, you're going to automatically lose some of the sugar, about 20% of it actually. So as it's flowing through, you're going to lose about 125 milliliters per minute of sugar into your kidney. That's going right into the kidney. Should you see that in the urine though? Should you see 125 milliliters of urine or sugar in the urine? No. Because what should be happening? What process? Reabsorption. Yep. So as you're filtering through, you put, oops, I skipped over that. That's how much you're filtering per minute. They're the actual number of pieces. So 100 pieces per minute, you get about 375 sugar transporters or sugar pumps. So can you pull all 100 of those pieces back? If you have 100 pieces that slip through and you have 375 hands trying to pull them back, can you get them? Absolutely. You see none slipping into the sugar or into the, the urine. So we bump up your sugar a little bit and you drink a half a can of soda. So you spike your blood sugar just a little. You still have the 375 transporters. Can you pull all those 125 pieces back? Sure, if you're a normal person. But let's say you have diabetes. With diabetes, you drink that whole can of soda. You can't pull that out of the blood. You can't store it. So your blood sugar spikes up to 500 milligrams per milliliter. You're losing 625 pieces into your urine or your filtrate every minute. Can those 375 transporters pull all 625 pieces back? Nope. So are you going to see any in the urine? Absolutely. Yeah, you're going to see it in the urine. So you can see that these transporter numbers, they don't change. What you do to your blood can change. The number of pieces you put into your filtrate can change, but the number of transporters don't change. So maximum is this point where you've hit that threshold. Right? You put 375 pieces into your filtrate, you can move 375 pieces and you break even. But the point where you just barely exceed that, that's called renal threshold. So, two terms. <coughs> Alright. By the way, these pumps, they're always going. It doesn't matter if you have sugar in there or not. They're always going. They're just going whir, 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 just spinning all the time. It's almost, I made, I used my juicer the other day and I was putting juice in and I just watched the thing whirl. I've been sick, so I find most stupid things amusing. And I'm just watching it. It's still spinning, but nothing's happening. And then I drop a carrot in and watch it bounce. That's kind of what your kidney does. It's constantly going. You're constantly turning these pumps, trying to pull sugar back in, whether there's sugar there or not. And then when sugar gets dumped in, shoop, it sucks it in right away. All right, phosphate's interesting because phosphate, the pumps aren't always running. It's an exception to the rule. Normally those pumps, if you have them, they're running. Even with sodium, if you have the pump, it's always turned on. It's always trying to pump. But with phosphate, it doesn't. With phosphate, you have to turn it off or turn it on because sometimes you can have enough phosphate in your blood and you don't want any more phosphate. And other times you don't have enough phosphate and you need to retain some. So this is a unique chemical is that their pumps can be turned off and on. And that's really the only significance of phosphate. Now, when we talk about the hormones later, we're going to come back to phosphate and you're going to find out that when you take in a lot of phosphate, you have to get rid of a lot of calcium. If you take in a lot of calcium, you have to get rid of a lot of phosphate. If you keep them both high, they stick together and they actually form bone. So do you want high phosphate in your kidney and high calcium in your kidney at the same time? What would they start forming? Stones, right? So it's always alternating back and forth. And I was thinking about this this weekend too. My brother's bones suck. When he was a kid, he drank a lot of soda, which is full of what? phosphate. When little kids drink a lot of phosphates, they spike their blood with phosphates, which means what do you know about their calcium in their blood? It decreases, right? So they're trying to keep the calcium low. So what part of their body is going to suffer because of all that low calcium? Their bone development. And another problem is that now they have all that calcium in their kidneys, that if they get phosphate and they're with the calcium, then they start getting kidney issues too. Okay. And this will probably be the last slide. So this is secretory processes. We talked about filtration, indiscriminate filtration at the glomerulus. We talked about reabsorption, pulling things back into the blood. But what if something didn't get filtered that's bad for you? When you go through the secretion process, it's taking that bad toxic substance or things that your body thinks are bad or you, if you have too much of it, it's going to hurt you, and pushes it out into the urine. It's a one-way ticket. This is an active process, so your body's putting energy into it. It has to be selective and intentionally want to get rid of these things. So something like acids, H+, plus, that's what acid is, hydrogen ions. What's K+, plus? potassium? Can you, is it possible 
that too much potassium could be bad for you? Absolutely. Potassium has a really low level in your blood, and when it spikes just a little bit, what organ is going to take a big hit? It was on the last test, and I told you it was really important. And if you wanted to kill somebody and you were a legal executioner, not because you just felt like somebody should die, you inject them with potassium chloride, and you're trying to do what to them? Stop their heart. Yeah. And you're right, it'll stop the neurons in their brain, too. So potassium is really important. You want to keep the potassium levels very strictly regulated. And then organic ions, like uh, different types of acids, like sulfuric acid, phosphoric acid. Right? So the secretory process is exactly the same as transepithelial transport, except it's reversed. So it's the same five steps, except instead of pulling from the tubule going all the way into the blood vessel, it's going from the blood vessel all the way through the five steps in reverse to the lumen of the tubule. Right. And here are the key ones that you have to remember. The first one is H+, which what I tell you, when you see this, you should automatically think what? Acid. Yeah. Hydrogen ions represent acid. So you can secrete acid, but you cannot reabsorb acid if you didn't catch that. It wasn't one of the things that were reabsorbed. You can filter it, you can secrete it, but you cannot reabsorb it. Alright, so it starts being added to the fluid at the proximal tubule, then some more is added at the distal and the collecting tubules. Those are the two primary places you move acids. Not the ascending loop, not the descending loop, just the beginning of the tubules and the very end of the tubules. Right. Potassium. Potassium is actively reabsorbed in the proximal tubule, and it's actively secreted in the distal tubule. It's interesting. Your kidney is really tightly regulating this potassium for you. If you need more, it helps you keep more. If, it, if you need to get rid of some, it helps you get rid of it. Potassium is one of those unique chemicals in the kidney in that way. You never see hydrogen being reabsorbed. You never see sodium being secreted. Potassium can be both. And then aldosterone stimulates secretion of potassium, enhancing sodium reabsorption. And you may not realize you knew this, but you knew this. You know that aldosterone regulates what ion that's not sodium. Or, oh, man, very good. So aldosterone regulates sodium by turning on a sodium pump. As soon as you turn on the pump, what else is aldosterone controlling? Potassium. As aldosterone does what with sodium? brings sodium in, it does what to potassium? Kicks potassium out. The sodium-potassium pump, remember? As soon as you turn that pump on, you move sodium in, move potassium out. And aldosterone turns those pumps on and off. Right. And then the last one here, organic substances. Those are non-filterable, so things that are too big. So some um, chemicals like penicillin. Penicillin is a big protein. It's hard to filter it, but you actively secrete it. Your body's like, ugh, this is from mold. Get rid of it. And tries to get rid of it as fast as possible. Okay. And then when we come back, we'll talk about some of the uh, specifics. So in lab this week, we actually are going to do urinalysis and talk about um, a little bit of urination while we're up there, too. <coughs> So, in other words, don't pee before you go to lab. I guess I wasn't specific there.